Is this a new era of ocean exploration? Where are we in, in opening that frontier? I think we are at the dawn because people are appreciating it. They understand the importance of the ocean. The future of mankind, I like to say, is underwater. Every time I dive, I see something I've never seen before that no human has probably ever seen before. For the last 110 years, the Titanic has sat at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Her secrets waiting for a time when man could safely navigate the depths of 13,000 feet. 12 years I've been working to do this. You were so excited about being able to make this happen. Now that you've done it, how do you feel? I'm in the same anticipation of what comes next. Strange story coming in uh, and fears are growing by the minute. A submersible vessel which takes people to see the wreck of the Titanic has gone missing in the Atlantic Ocean. And may only have about 96 hours of oxygen on board for survival. Search crews racing against time to find that missing submersible. There is no excuse for what happened here. Should tighten it down in the water. The ocean is a mysterious and unexplored place. It holds captivating underwater landscapes that seem from outer space, shipwrecks that haven't been seen for centuries, and a treasure trove of undiscovered plants and creatures. In fact, the deep sea is so unexplored that only 5% of the global oceans have been seen by humanity. Despite our achievements in space exploration, walking on the moon, establishing orbital stations, and even mapping distant planets, the mysteries of our own planet's deep waters elude us. However, driven by an unwavering determination to explore the unknown, one man would defy the depths and plunge into the abyss. But all of this starts here, in the bustling city of San Francisco, on March 31st, 1962, when Stockton Rush was born. Little did his family know that this child's journey would lead him to become one of the most controversial and innovative individuals the underwater industry had ever seen. Raised in a family of means, with roots tracing back to the signers of the Declaration of Independence, Rush had the world at his fingertips. From an early age, he dreamed of exploring the stars, to be the first human to set foot on Mars and gaze upon the wonders of the cosmos. But fate had a different path in store for him. In 1980, at the age of only 18, he was told that his visual acuity would disqualify him from becoming a military aviator and ever being an astronaut. But Rush didn't give up and decided to make a complete 180. Instead of traveling to space, he shifted his focus to exploring the deep seas. Around 2005, he began his search to buy a submarine. However, this turned out to be an almost impossible task. There were only around 100 privately owned underwater crafts in the entire world, and only a handful of them were being sold. But then, in 2009, everything would change. The goal was, where do you want to go in the, in the ocean? What is the most known site in the ocean? And it's clearly the Titanic. During that year, Rush and Guillermo Sonlin would go on to found Oceangate, and they even managed to line up a deal to buy their first submersible from Pete Hoffman. The deal went through, and Rush's company bought the underwater craft called Antipodes for $295,000 US dollars. But the Antipodes could only dive 1,000 feet deep, and this was far from what Rush wanted to do. His dream was to go to the deepest points, to innovate in the deep sea mining industry and help uncover the mysteries of the ocean floor. There are only a handful of subs, I think about five subs. Most are owned by governments, run by research institutions. Uh, there is no private access to the deep ocean. And yet, there's all this life to be discovered. Since buying such a powerful underwater craft was pretty much impossible, he had to shift from purchasing the submersibles to improving existing crafts or straight up building his own. Initially, we didn't think we were gonna build our own subs. We thought we were gonna get somebody else to build our subs. The industry standard just wouldn't allow for them to build what we felt we needed uh, and what we thought humanity needed to explore the ocean. In 2013, Oceangate would change forever. The company finally pivoted from buying submersibles to designing their own. And in March of 2015, they revealed their first modified submersible. 
The Cyclops was a steel-hulled five-man submersible that had been modified to include a wireless controller, but it was only able to dive down to 1,640 feet. And because of the length, you can have a camera in there taking an image of both scientists working as well as doing interviews at depth, which is very unique. You don't get that on other submersibles that don't have the ability to take five people at once at depth. And even though it was a step in the right direction, it was still a far cry from the depths that Rush aimed for. This meant that quickly after the Cyclops was revealed, plans for a more powerful submersible were drafted. Carbon fiber is three times better on a strength to buoyancy basis than titanium. And yet no one had done that. And there are uh, certifying or semi-certifying agencies, the uh, Pressure Vessels for Human Occupation Committee that uh, handles hyperbaric chambers and submarines. You have the SubSafe program in the, uh, in the Navy. These programs are uh, over the top in their rules and regulations, but they had nothing with carbon fiber. So we had to go out and, uh, and work on that. And one of the things I learned is, you know, when you're outside the box, it's really hard to tell how far outside the box you really are. Rush wanted to use carbon fiber composites to build the underwater craft, as this would allow for a less expensive and more customizable design. However, carbon fiber is a highly controversial material when it comes to underwater crafts. Carbon fiber composites are used very, very successfully for internal pressure, pressure vessels, like let's say a scuba tank. And you can get two or three times multiple of what you could get out of steel or aluminum for, uh, for that type of pressure bottle. But for something that's seeing external pressure, all of the advantages of composite materials go away and all the disadvantages come into play. So if you're using a uniform material like steel or uh, titanium or ceramic or acrylic, um, you can do computer modeling with a high degree of, of accuracy and confidence. The second you start doing carbon composite or, or any kind of composite materials, you're introducing two materials that are in, in contact with each other the filament itself and then the epoxy matrix that it, that it sits within. And at that point you have degradation failure. So it, we always understood that this was the wrong material for submersible hulls because with each pressure cycle you can have progressive damage. In the case of Ocean Gate, they wanted to make an entire hull out of carbon fiber with only the left and right extremes being made from titanium a decision that had the entire underwater industry worried. Even Rob McCallum, a consultant who worked with Rush and was able to review the development, claimed that there were not one, but multiple points of failure in the development of the submersible. However, when Rush was questioned about his decisions, he said, I'd like to be remembered as an innovator. Um, as the, I think it was General MacArthur said, you're remembered for the rules you break. And you know, I've broken some rules to make this, I think I've broken them with, with logic and good engineering behind me, the carbon fiber and titanium. There's a rule you don't do that. Well, I did. In 2018, OceanGate revealed the world's first carbon fiber submersible and named it Cyclops II. The vehicle was the first of its kind. Equipped with a carbon fiber composite hull, systems for easy and intuitive control via a PlayStation-like controller, and a new acoustic system to detect any cracking of the new hull. In addition to this, they claimed that the craft had been created and tested with the help of NASA, Boeing, and the University of Washington. Everything seemed perfect, but was this really the truth? Absolutely not. A NASA spokesperson said that NASA, quote, did not conduct testing and manufacturing via its workforce or facilities." Unquote. A Boeing spokesperson also said that Boeing, quote, was not a partner on the Titan and did not design or build it. Lastly, the University of Washington stated that the Applied Physics Laboratory had no involvement in, quote, design, engineering, or testing of the Titan submersible. However, this isn't completely true, and there are several documents linking them to Ocean Gate's Titan. In one of their cooperation PDFs, they explicitly talk about Titan's carbon fiber hull and state, quote, the first test of a scale model of the Cyclops filament wound carbon fiber hull designed and manufactured by Spencer Composites in collaboration with Ocean Gate and APL UW. 
Furthermore, OceanGate hired several interns from the university to help with the development of their acoustic safety systems. So, the University of Washington might be lying about their involvement to avoid possible lawsuits or to save their reputation as a whole. The situation eventually boiled over when David Lockridge, an ex-director of marine operations at OceanGate, wrote a report claiming that the submersible was unfit to be used because it needed more testing. Lockridge inspected every, ass, every major component of the sub and found that glue was coming away from the scenes of the ballast bags. You had mounting bolts threatening to rupture things, ceiling faces that had errant plunge holes, O-ring grooves that deviated from standard parameters. Everything that could go wrong was sort of going wrong. There were snagging hazards. There were important components attached with zip ties, flammable flooring, um, and the interior vinyl wrapping would emit highly toxic gases upon ignition. But the number one concern for Lockridge was that the actual core of this submarine, the pressure boundary, which is what keeps people alive at 3,800 meters where Titanic is, where the external water pressure is about 6,000 pounds per square inch, is made of carbon fiber, which is not used at the, in deep ocean submersibles. So he examined that, a, a section of it and found that it was filled with, um, with you know, little little holes. He, he held a, it was delaminating these layers. It was porous. He held a light behind it and found that the light was streaming through and he refused to sign off on the dive. And Stockton Rush said that because you refused to sign off on this manned testing, you cannot do your job as director of marine operations. And so he fired him on the spot. After word of these events spread, Robert McCallum, the consultant who previously worked with Rush, privately reached out to him, saying that he was putting the entire industry at risk. But Rush's answer was none other than, quote, Since Guillermo and I have started OceanGate, we have heard the baseless cries of, quote, you're going to kill someone, unquote, way too often. I take this as a serious personal insult. Unquote. But all of these narcissistic business decisions, malpractices, and lies would eventually catch up to the company in a disastrous fashion. June 18th, 2023. Early in the morning, Rush and his team got ready to do another dive to the Titanic. On board the Titan was Rush himself, British businessman and adventurer Hamish Harding, Titanic expert Paul Henri Narjolet, and Pakistani businessman Shazada Dawood and his 19-year-old son Suleiman, all of whom had signed a waiver that claimed the submersible was an experimental craft, including eight death clauses and even stated that most of the dives don't even reach the Titanic. At around 8 a.m., the Titan set off from its mothership, the Polar Prince, heading for the remains of the Titanic at some 12,500 feet below the surface of the ocean. At 9.47 a.m., the 21-foot submersible lost contact with its mothership, and since the submersible had no GPS, the craft was only guided by text messages from the surface ship, which indicated where and when the submersible should resurface. The scheduled resurface time was 3 p.m. The Polar Prince crew was nervously awaiting the ascent of the Titan. However, as the minutes went by, nothing happened. No messages were received, and the craft was nowhere to be seen. Something bad had happened, but nobody was sure about what exactly was going on in the depths of the sea. Concerns now about oxygen supplies. According to the operator OceanGate, it's equipped with three oxygen systems, including some scuba tanks under the floor panels, and it's built to provide oxygen for its five occupants for around 96 hours, and that would in theory last until Thursday morning. The situation was becoming more and more intense by the minute, with the US and Canadian Coast Guard crews scouring the ocean's surface with helicopters and planes, using sonar to listen for sounds far below the water, and asking nearby commercial ships to assist in the search. The location of the search is approximately 900 miles uh, east of Cape Cod, uh, in a water depth of uh, roughly 13,000 feet. It is uh, a challenge to conduct a uh, search in that remote area, but we are deploying all available assets. June 20th, 
Search crews attempting to locate a submarine missing off the coast of Newfoundland in Canada have reportedly heard banging sounds near the wreck of the Titanic. The banging from inside the sub were at 30 minute intervals and went on for what could be heard four hours later. So obviously someone in the sub presumably has been banging every half hour. If they are alive and, um, and okay, you know, the, the fear and desperation must be just something uh, unimaginable, but um, it's certainly very hopeful news and, and uh, we, we continue to, to hope for an, uh, an amazing outcome here. A Canadian P-3 aircraft detected underwater noises. However, at the same time, another aircraft discovered what seemed like a surfaced craft, but the authorities couldn't send teams to both locations. They eventually opted to investigate the underwater noises and relocated all of their resources to the location of these sounds. And it seemed that a successful rescue was still possible. This is still an active search and rescue mission that hope has not been lost, that every effort is still being made to locate that submersible and, if possible, to enact some sort of rescue. At this point, the submersible was running low on oxygen, and it seemed as if the crew was doomed. Every possible tool was being used to save the crew. The US and Canada moved in military and commercial assets, and even a research ship with an underwater robot was dispatched by the French government. But nothing was going as planned, and the hours slowly went by. Operating at these depths, there's a very thin margin of, of chance when something goes wrong to be saved. Uh, you've got a couple of issues. Had If this submersible has gone to the bottom, you just don't have an oxygen issue. You have a heat issue because of the temperature below the surface, 13,000 feet down. It's almost freezing down there. Uh, you would have an issue where the crew may not last long enough because of the lack of heat, let alone water and food. Retired Navy Captain David Marquet stated that if they were alive, quote, they're freezing cold. They're probably all huddled together trying to conserve their body heat. The time that the crew spent in the Titan would have been a hellish, anxiety-inducing period, where minutes seemed like hours and hours like days. All of this while looking into the dark nothingness that is the deep sea world. The good news is that we haven't had bad news. You know, they haven't found wreckage, they haven't found debris. Um, and there are now, finally, there are drones there on site um, at the bottom looking for them. So uh, there's still good news. The banging noises that we've heard was, was very positive news, uh, but it's really somber to think about what it must be like down there in that submarine for those men. You did receive a text message from your friend just before he left on the dive. What did that message say? Diving to the Titanic shortly, it was an exclamation point. He was very excited about it. Um, uh, it said, weather permitting, the weather's been bad there, as I'm sure those in Newfoundland know. Um, and uh, that was it. It was pretty quick to the point he was just about to get in the submarine to go down. So uh, it was something he and the whole crew were very excited to do. Uh, it said, realizing the dream of a lifetime to see this historic uh, place. And so he was just excited. An ROV, a remote operated vehicle, from the vessel Horizon Arctic discovered the tail cone of the Titan submersible approximately 1,600 feet from the bow of the Titanic on the seafloor. The ROV subsequently found additional debris. In consultation with experts from within the Unified Command, the debris is consistent with the catastrophic loss of the pressure chamber. Upon this determination, we immediately notified the families. On behalf of the United States Coast Guard and the entire Unified Command, I offer my deepest condolences to the families. Because the hull was made from carbon fiber composites, which had been put under repeated amounts of stress without the proper maintenance, the hull of the submersible most likely experienced what is known as delamination. This is the process of splitting or separating of the composite material that holds the different materials together. 
Once this occurs, it disrupts the bond that holds the fibers together, resulting in a wider region of separation within the material. And repeated instances of delamination, especially in deep underwater conditions, would undoubtedly compromise the material's structural integrity. Furthermore, if these unwanted changes accumulate and aren't addressed, they will inevitably lead to a critical split or crack in the material. A scratch, a nick, or a gouge, or a hole is going to cause a stress concentration. Especially if it's going to be used under hundreds of feet of water with people inside of it. It's not what we consider rocket science to inspect it. It's non-destructive inspection using ultrasound, which is the same kind of ultrasound that they use in the medical industry to see what's going on inside your body. Kress estimates an ultrasound inspection of the Titan would have cost about $20,000. Cost effective, he says, especially if passengers are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for a ride to the bottom of the sea. Non-destructive inspection is not a rarity in the world of composites. It's what we do all the time. The pressure that is exerted at the depths at which the Titan was diving are around 380 times the pressure of the atmosphere that we feel above sea level. At these pressure levels, even the slightest separating of the composite material in the hull can cause tiny changes to its structure, and once this occurs, the entire structure of the hull would be compromised. However, these micro-splits can be prevented to a certain degree. And when it comes to underwater vehicles, this is usually done with autoclaves. These are pressurized vessels that compact and harden the materials used in the hull via a process known as curing. This is an essential part of the construction of any underwater vehicle. The next step to prevent these micro-splits is by extensive fatigue testing, where the submersible is subjected to various types of load simulations this is done to identify any potential weak points, design flaws, or material limitations that could lead to fatigue failure over time. I'm thrusting and nothing's happening. Am I spinning? Yes. I am? Yes. Looks like it. Now you're going north. Oh my god. When I'm thrusting forward, one of the thrusters is thrusting backwards right now. So the only thing I can do right now is a 360. Hey, Jerome, uh, Stockton uh, on Wendy's phone. Just call it back if you get a chance. We get a question uh, on the dive right now, looking to see if there's a way to remap the uh, PS3 controller. Should Titan have been in the water? As an experimental vehicle, we're always trying to push the boundaries of technology to make it more affordable and more accessible for scientists. But in this case, taking paying passengers to the Titanic on a submersible that was probably not fully tested was probably unwise. And here lies the big issue with the company. OceanGate didn't conduct enough fatigue testing of the submersible because it would have taken too long. In addition to this, they made the first hull in 2017 and then rebuilt the vehicle in 2020 because it was showing signs of cycle fatigue. This meant that the dives from 2018 and 2019 were taking such a toll on the submersible that even OceanGate thought it wasn't safe anymore. So even though OceanGate knew roughly how many dives they could do before the Titan got close to reaching cycle fatigue, the craft was still being pushed to its limits in mid-2023. And this is inexplicable. OceanGate had to know that the craft was about to give out, but for whatever reason, they were pushing it to its limits again, almost as if they wanted to squeeze every penny out of the vehicle before they rebuilt it in late 2023. Rush was known to try and convince people to go on his craft, with Patrick Leahy, president of Triton Submarines, claiming that he used predatory behavior to try and convince people to go on his craft. Financier Jay Bloom has a similar story. Stockton, you know, I think his, his heart was in the right place, and he, he really was passionate about his project, and he believed everything he was saying. But uh, one of the things that concerned me was he told me he was flying in to see me and he was landing at North Las Vegas Airport, which is a, an odd selection. Most people that come in privately come into either McCarran, which is now Harry Reid International, or they come into Henderson Executive. 
And uh, I asked him why, and he said he was coming in on a, a two-seater experimental plane that he built. And I started to think about, it. he's coming in on a two-seater experimental plane to pitch me out to go on a five-seater experimental sub that he built down to the ocean floor to see the Titanic. And it was just, it was, it was uh, he has a different risk appetite than I do. Bloom also stated that Rush said that the submersible trip would be, quote, safer than crossing the street, unquote. But thankfully for the Bloom family, they declined because they saw a lot of red flags in Ocean Gate's videos. Jay gave up their seats on the Titan for this trip. Another father and son did take those seats. They went on the Titan and, as we know, uh, sadly and tragically lost their lives. When you first learned that the Titan was missing, uh, and then on those days they were hoping for rescue, you're imagining like everybody else, that, but for you it's different, that it could have been you down there, right? Gasping for air. Then you find out it imploded. Um, and you keep seeing images of the father and son who did take your seats. What went through your mind? Well, um, it, it's, it's a very uh, surreal experience in the beginning. You know, you know you're supposed to be on, the, on that, uh, or you had the opportunity to be on that, on that sub. And um, uh, you, see, you see all this, it's everywhere, everywhere we looked. And the most haunting thing about it is when you look at, at the news I, and open my laptop on social media, on <coughs> television, it's, it was everywhere. And they'd show pictures of, of the, the people who lost their lives and all I could see when I saw that father and son was myself and my son. That could have been us yeah. in that picture. And Sean, I mean, obviously, uh, the, the other young man there, he was 19, you're 20, right? I mean, it, 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 it is eerie, the, the parallels. Rush's behavior definitely opens the question of why he was desperately trying to convince as many passengers as he could and if he was pressured by his investors to do as many dives as possible before rebuilding the craft again. In addition to this, a Glassdoor review from February 2023, a few months before the disaster occurred, claims that the company is highly dangerous, tries to not pay their employees, and even states that the company doesn't make any money at all. So something was definitely going on. In addition to all of these glaring issues, OceanGate never went to get the craft classified with the DNV, nor any other classification company. And this is exactly why they received so much criticism throughout the years. In the end, Rush, who was arguably a genius with big dreams, succumbed to pure greed and narcissism, or perhaps pressure from OceanGate investors. As for the occupants of the craft, since they died in mere milliseconds, their deaths were absolutely painless. But our condolences lie with their families, and we hope that companies such as SpaceX and more see this case as an important reminder that, even though innovation is necessary, we shouldn't put the lives of innocent people at risk for monetary gain. Sometimes Mother Nature works for you, and sometimes Mother Nature is a Stockton Rush. Video narrated by Eric Peabody.